Thank you, Dr. DeRussi. That was quite an introduction, and I hope we can live up to it, and the doors are open. If you get tired of it, I guess you can leave, and if you do, please leave quietly. <laughs> Our family history and story of success in agriculture is based on celebrating the big moments and learning how to weather the emotional, physical, and financial storms. You can say that pork production started many years ago. I was an avid 4-H'er and I had a very good county agent and the motto of 4-H back in those days, you learn by doing. And the more you do, the more you learn. And so that applies at our farm yet today. You've got to learn by doing. I really wanted to be involved in beef cattle, show steers, raise heifers, but I soon found out that the generation interval was very long, the cash flow was short in coming, and the initial investment was quite high. So with the help of my county agent, I got started in 1954 by winning a Sears Roebuck Gilt for a 4-H project. The requirements of that project was each year you had to give the best gilt in your production to keep the program going. And many of you don't know this, but Sears and Roebuck was really instrumental in funding a lot of agricultural projects back in the early 1900s. And if you could believe today, worldwide, Sears only has 25 stores left. <clears throat> With this shorter generation of interval of raising pigs and the cash flow associated with it, and I expanded that project to help for nearly all pay of my college education. But then again, college in those days cost a lot, lot less. Obviously, writing an essay to win a Sears Gilt was certainly much more easy than trying to get a good grade in Kansas State University's written comm classes. <laughs> As a sideline, both Jan and I had the wonderful opportunity to grow in 4-H. It has been a very important and influential part of our lives, as well as our children and now our grandchildren. I sure didn't know about that legacy as I was standing here, or as I was tending to pigs on pasture, raising pork with a modified barn, farrowing stalls out of a horse barn. Obviously, those sows in that day didn't have very much muscle, or something is wrong because those one inch boards certainly wouldn't hold a sow today. <clears throat> in 1960, I started college at Kansas State University. Craig Good was a, teenager, or a, a junior high student. We had a workout here at Kansas State for the judging teams prior to the American Royal. I think Greg, Craig might have been a sixth, seventh, or eighth grader. He went through that placing contest and would you believe he outplaced all those college students in that workout? And Craig, I had the great opportunity of having your father, the late Dr. Don Good, who was an excellent livestock judge and a super judging team coach. He was one of the best for that era. He challenged our judging team saying that if we were going to raise livestock, then we needed to raise livestock to the very best of our abilities. Besides both Jan and I graduating from Kansas State University, we are pleased that our two children and their spouses all graduated from Kansas State and that our kids had the experience to be on either the meats or the livestock judging team or both. Following graduation, I had a short stint with Dow Chemical Company as a herbicide field man in Illinois, and I got the real bug to grow corn. Because my father had grown corn, but had to quit. Many of you have never heard of the Southwestern corn borer, but he was an interesting little creature in the fall when he got ready to overwinter. He'd girdle around the bottom of the corn stalk, making it very weak in the first windstorm, it all fell over. So we had to quit growing corn in the early 50s. 
following my stint with the Dow Chemical Company and Jan's year of teaching in Denver, Colorado. She was able to get a teaching job in Hudson, Kansas. We got married in Olathe and bought the Stafford County Irrigated Farm on the same day. We wanted to raise kids, crops, and livestock. <clears throat> in 1972, Dr. Harry Anthony from the Kansas State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab made several visits to our farm trying to figure out why we could not keep baby pigs alive. Veterinarian Dr. Joe Knappenberger, my father-in-law, really encouraged Dr. Anthony to come up with an answer. And it was a major breakthrough when they discovered that we had pseudorabies. We were the first documented case of pseudorabies in the state of Kansas. This was financially and emotionally very devastating as we were an accredited SPF herd and we had to depopulate. We decided to no longer raise pigs except for the kids in their 4-H projects. And then there were successes. Brian, age eight, started showing pigs in 1978. In his first year, he had the reserve grand champion barrel at the Kansas Junior Livestock Show. This led to many years of showing and raising pigs. We never spent much money for a show pig, and we raised several of them ourselves. We jumped Mo, a purebred Yorkshire barrel, out of a pickup stock rack on three bales of straw at the American Royal in 1984, since they had no chute to unload vehicles because every other pig showman had the fortunate ability to have a stock trailer. We had no idea that he would be selected the overall grand champion at the American Royal or that he would set a high sale price that stood for 11 years or that he would have cultivated a unique friendship with the purchasers for Jennifer's adult life. The profits from Mo started Brian and Jennifer's joint venture of raising pigs called Golden D Livestock. And over the next few years, it was a way they could raise more show pigs and fund a good portion of their college educations. <clears throat> In 1987, Art Sauter, who was a super duper Purina salesman, sold us on the idea of trying to range raise turkeys along with a lot of our neighbors. That was a good experience because we all found out what vertical integration really meant. Art was an innovator and a forward thinker, and he was trying to develop some industry within our county and surrounding counties to generate income and to allow young people to remain. His next thought was maybe we should have a swine project and Art, do you remember coming to Stafford County, talking to the Economic Strategic Planning Committee and putting in some swine units to use another market for the irrigated corn raised in the area? Anyway, in that process, I decided I wanted to try Dr. Don Good's theory that we needed to be good selectors of livestock and I wanted to be the one producing the gilts and a genetic multiplier to portion out to the folks that we could maybe get to work in the county. Art, that we weren't very good salesmen. That didn't carry on in our locality, but it did carry on as forming a user group for other producers in Missouri and Oklahoma. In 1993, I made the decision to be a, build a 500 sow herd multiplier user group success. In 1993, ground was broken on the corner of the quarter section of our family homestead. It was built in the center of the section. I did not know at the time, but there were no residents built on a half mile line of east-west roads. Thus, we had minimal or no complaints on order issues. We had a great isolation 
and super biosecurity from the rest of the area. In the summer of 1998, the multiplier farm broke with PERS, which came in with replacement breeding stock that we would isolate them in an off-site gilt development barn until veterinarians believed that they were no longer shedding the virus. We also broke with influenza at the same time. I remember our account manager saying, if you'd had that barn full of pigs, look at all the money you would have lost on the $8 pig market in 1998. What we thought was a disaster turned out to be a real blessing. Furthermore, Darrell Olson and two of the PIC account managers, shortly after we built our barn, came for a pheasant hunting trip and toured our pig barn. Darrell liked what he saw, and thus we were able to cultivate a relationship with AMVC to ultimately join with them in 2002. How fitting that Dr. Olson presented a session this morning about the growth and the success of the swine industry. And maybe, just maybe, our multiplier unit played an important role in their growth and success as we sent all the pigs from our multiplier to AMVC for 18 years. And today, AMVC is number nine in the United States for pork powerhouses. When we converted one of our finished barns to 512 gestation crates, this increased our sow herd from 500 to 1100 without changing the footprint. We utilized off-site finisher locations to isolate females while we were cleaning up and converting the barn. We also utilized an off-site facility to house our remaining gilts so we could have some cash flow. The unique part about this transition was that we then could select our own replacement gilts to our standards and we were able to permanently close our herd. When we brought the stock home, our breeding cycles did not go very well, leaving us to think, what are we doing wrong? And it left us asking a lot of questions. It was a rocky for a couple months as we were not hitting targets, but as it turned out, our re-permitting process to expand the farrowing area was delayed and we did not get final approval until the very end of 2002. Had we hit our targets, we would have been trying to farrow 50 sows a week in only 120 total crates. In 1984, the sweetest words I ever heard was when the American Royal Hog Joe told Jennifer, young lady, nobody can beat your pig. And that lasted until Mr. Scott Fort Miller, a teleton, intuitive and valuable employee, came along and asked for my daughter's hand. We celebrate. On May 4, 2007, the tornado that wiped out the city of Greensburg cut a path right between our swine unit and our house and shop buildings. The damage was noteworthy as it completely destroyed two irrigation sprinkler systems. But the next night, when the storm fired up again along the, nearly the very same path, except off by a quarter mile, this time our hog barns took a direct hit. Thanks to the close neighbors, lots of people from all over the area, the state of Kansas, the Kansas Pork Association, KFRM Radio, the Oklahoma Pork Producers, we put out a plea that we needed a place to go with pigs. Our farm had a total of 900 foot of barn length combined. When the tornado was over, we had 100 foot of fairing space that was not touched. Here's an excerpt from a video we created about our hog farm and subsequent tornado damage. We would show this video to people since they couldn't tour our facility due to the biosecurity reasons. But you can get a feel for the tornado damage. 
We never lost a pig from the tornado. But when we had, when we had to put those sows in groups of housing, we lost 60 sows. a place to move our pigs that was clean because we have a high health herd it took us about a week till we got the pigs moved out our saving grace was cool temperatures we could generate electricity to supply water and we crawled around on our hands and knees uh, feeding the sows it took about four months to rebuild the pig barn we still have some work to do but uh, we had the pigs back home in september and up to full production uh, shortly thereafter During the quiet days that following the tornado when we had no power, we had helicopters fly over checking out the tornado damage and the route that President George W. Bush would take to go tour Greensburg. We thought the pigs in the barn would nearly pull out every anchor bolt when they heard those helicopters fly over. <laughs> Evidently, it sounded very much like another tornado. Then in 2008, we had another storm hit pork producers with high grain costs, crippling markets, and depressed attitudes about raising pork that more pork producers were forced out. It just left us with an uneasy feeling about the future of our farm. Backing up to 2007, we had to use some other off-site farming facilities and witnessing how our county fair was dealing with the dwindling numbers of 4-H swine projects, we decided in January 2008 to ferrule one more group of sows in this off-site facility to create a low-cost, family-budget, friendly, cookie-cutter project pig, not show pigs, for area 4-Hers. About 120 pigs were dispersed for the summer county fairs. Here you can see Joel DeRucci with a really puzzling look on his face <laughs> <coughs> trying to figure out something nice to say and encourage the 4-H'ers with those pigs that he wondered what rock did they come out from under. <laughs> they were not typically show pigs. Do you remember that, Joel? <laughs> you should have had a lot of easy bottoms. For our county, 4-H kids, they weren't pursuing the purple ribbons, but were wanting something healthy that would grow fast and be predominantly problem free. As a seed stock producer, we were happy to know where the pigs were coming from for the county fair, instead of them bringing outside pigs to our area without the thought of outside diseases. While they didn't get the purple ribbons in the show ring, these pigs routinely won every carcass contest and the 4-H'ers had the opportunity to make good premiums and take home pay from these pigs. Eventually, after two generations, we were able to get the white bred out of these project pigs as a way to confuse show ring judges. <laughs> <clears throat> Showing the pig in this class in 2020 was our grandson, Ian. But all in all, we hope the 4-H'ers grained a greater appreciation and love for the pork industry. We need all of the food animal ambassadors we can get our heads on to counter the foodies, the people that are attacking the red meat industry, and we hope some of these youngsters will be able to tell a story and help to stem some of the tide of people advocating not to eat meat. For 12 years, we did this the pig purchase price never went above $85. We did not want to bankrupt the 4-H'ers before their project started. Hopefully this project can be a part of our legacy as we help 4-H'ers have a fiscal successful start. Thank you, Dr. Jerusi. We use your 4-H project swine guide that we gave to every 4-H'er with the project pig. Another storm that hit in 2012 with high corn prices and depressed markets, we made concessions and took lower prices for our pigs. 
thinking that when times got better, the scale would all balance out. But it was never reversed, so we had to get lean and stay lean so we could stay in the swine industry. We raise all our own corn, and it is all irrigated. We use variable rate seeding, prescription fertilizing. We believe in soil tissue tests during the growing season to identify any type of deficiency that we might have growing in that corn crop. We also use the BT trait of Viptera that keeps earworms out of the end of the corn and reduces the possibility of molds on our corn. We want to raise the very best corn that is nutritionally complete when combined with the other ingredients in our diets so that we can fully express the genetics of the pigs we're raising. We process our own feed and thus no outside feed trucks enter the pig barn area, which enforces our biosecurity. I've told you the first part of our story. Now I will turn it over to Scott Fort Miller, who will tell you the rest of the story. Thank you, Leon. And as they had the, sorry, Jennifer, you're running the remote, so we kind of stay on task. I mean, I can run the TV at home, but apparently that's different. Some of the undergraduates that were here, I was one of them students that went into commercial pork production. Now, don't worry about that January push, panic. Mine was the Thursday before finals. I wasn't, wor I wasn't worried at all. I walked into Dr. Jim Nelson's office. I would visit with him when I had nothing else to do or, or he didn't want to do something. I don't know. And he just asked, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. Go back home to the family farm, maybe. Find a job there. And he said somebody called him in the morning, and there was an opportunity. Now, I'm not saying it'll all work out with you, that you might marry eventually into something, but, it, you know, there's a little benefit there. But today, I'm up here as the employee, not as the son-in-law. So, now we can advance. In 2014, you know, like many in Kansas and across the country, PDV, uh, found its way into our herd as well in March. Uh, we don't know how, and when we were going through it, as they kind of said, uh, you know, we could spend all our resources trying to figure out just how in the heck you got it, but now we've got to figure out how we get it walked out of here. And so that's what we concentrated on. But it was so emotionally and, of course, financially devastating for the farrowing farms across this country as well as ours, and it took a toll on our help as the cleanup was very time-consuming and very detailed. But one of the benefits of being on the Kansas Pork Association board at that time was a fellow board member. They were going through the same situation that we were and reached out to him and said, can you share your protocol with me? And we were on that pretty quick. You know, it seems like forever to get that walked out as you're living through it. But... Uh, was really amazed at how good a job our staff did to get that set production was back up. But there's a blip on our production, as you'll see. You hear many people say, though, that 2014 had high prices. You know, you heard them in the summertime, fall. Yeah, that's really good if you're selling the finishing pig, but if you're the ISO wing contract pig producer, not so good. You were kind of stuck with the, the pigs that died they got the ones that survived. So, 2015. You know, we had such a good time with a tornado in, in uh, 2007 that we thought, you know, why not just order up one more? So on April 2, I guess, thank the Lord, if that would be it, we had another tornado on Monday, Thursday. But this time we knew what to do to save the barn from collapsing. If you remember in the video how the truss is all just laid down, and part of that is the day following that tornado, we had an immense amount of rain, four inches or something. It saturated our insulation, and it just pulled it all down. Yeah, hindsight, there's some things we could have done, which is what we did with this one. We shored up it on the underside, and every rotten board we could find, we made a purlin out of it and stretched them back up there and uh, tried to keep that thing because no way did we want to have to rebuild that from the bottom again. That just was difficult. 
And after that experience in 07, of trying to find off-site space, every time we'd go on vacation, I'd just kind of like mental notes, hey, there's a pig barn. I think it's empty. Maybe you're going to have to use it sometime. Because when you're facing with one of these, it really doesn't matter what it looks like. As soon as you walk in the door, you're like, I'll take it. We need a place. And uh, that wasn't going to be it. We weren't going to do that again. But this time, we didn't have all that extra rain, so it didn't pull it down. But you can see the trusses are showing that they're getting a little bit of strain on it. We did bust a few of the plates in there. But, you know, when you first walk up to it, you'd see it and you'd say, oh, it looks pretty good. Yeah, not so good the next day, but we wanted it to stay like that and rebuild it as fast as we could. So Good Friday came, and it brought highly experienced neighbors who were well-versed in tornado damage cleanup since our county had the, well, eight years out of the previous nine, our county had experienced tornadoes, and some of them were only within a mile and a half of our 07 one, which took out our neighbors and we knew how to help them and they knew how to help us and we actually had to hold off the neighbors from cleaning it up too early because we need to get insurance adjuster pictures taken because he couldn't make it over in time because we weren't going to wait but in his words they were you guys know what to do just do it i don't want to have to write a big check we'll write a check but not a big one so we had to kind of hold them back and we applied the lessons we learned in 07 to get it rebuilt and in the period of less than a week, we had the roofs completely restored on that barn. I called in the contractor that we had had to do a house project for me, and uh, he was there uh, putting new purlins on on Saturday morning. Experience helps. 2017, another challenge was given to the farm that our current system for raising pigs was no longer a fit for our current buying customer. So it forced us that summer to look for other options. How could the Dunswine unit best serve another entity? We started looking at other options and fostered a relationship with a company that they felt like a pretty good fit that we could make a long-term partnership with. But you know, at the end of the day, we reached a solution. And with our current company, we chose to stay loyal to that 15-year partner and customer without going through a complete depop and a startup situation again. Was this your water, Leon? <laughs> That's the benefit of being family. <laughs> well, we rode together in the car too. So, oh yeah, and then that would be in 2020, COVID, and there I just shared a glass. <laughs> COVID happened. You know, the pig market tanked, you all are aware of that, due to no slaughter capacity. Uh, checkbooks were tightening up. Nobody wanted to buy any guilds. Uh, we lost our market for our guilds and our barrows. We, uh, I just kind of, we just kind of just took it upon ourselves and says we don't want to be one that has to euthanize pigs. And whatever we had to do to nickel and dime them is uh, what we done. We had people. We were selling market pigs through that summer, and the one person said, "I don't care what you're asking. We're giving you more." We want you here next year when we want to buy a woman. But we had the opportunity. We could have stayed in that long-term partnership if we only would double our capacity and spend approximately $2 million. We chose not to accept that opportunity, but rather reached out to the company we explored in 2017. They liked our site, our biosecurity, and the knowledge and experience of our staff for raising pigs as a multiplier. In record time, we were able to depop late in the fall and start a repop in January of 2021. As the flow just happened to all fall into place with what they had available, and as our timeline was, it just seemed like the perfect fit. But to make it even more challenging, we are farmers. We picked a great time to depop a sow herd when the prices were like low, and then repopped them when the sow prices had rebounded. That's just typical farmer's luck. Twenty twenty was a challenge for us on the farm as well as for a lot of producers in the swine industry. But on a personal level, it challenged our family. 
To date, this was the most critical, important storm we weathered. I'd like to tell you why we were the real winners in 2021. Jan was hospitalized on Sunday following Thanksgiving in 2020 with COVID. On day 45, we were told Jan would likely be on supplemental oxygen the rest of her life and probably never walk again. She spent 127 days in our local county hospital fighting through and recovering from COVID. On Good Friday, she was released from that hospital and uh, this picture shows how she rose above the COVID challenge as it was taken on Easter Sunday. It took less than one day of her absence on the farm to realize just how integral and important Jan is to the farm business, the family, and family dynamics. Thank goodness she could text and coach us from a hospital bed because we were not able to go into her room for a month, only through the window. And resting on faith uh, and eternal hope, we truly believe in the power of prayer and the healing from the great physician up above. It truly had a, it had a strong, it was the healing power. Nice. Oh, we've lost a clicker. Oh, 2021, yay. We celebrated. We started a brand new genetic line. We were placed on the top of the seed stock pyramid as a nucleus farm for our new, new partner that we had joined with. Our first litter farrowed. She had 16. We're off to a great start. It was sweet to witness our employee as she saw the first piglets in 10 months. She cuddled it up to her cheek. Well, I was kind of touched, you know. But that was exactly the same thing I had done when I turned on the lights in the morning when I saw them too. But with this farrowing, we started off with a new batch system, which we were told we were going to love it. We were going to be on a four-week batch. Uh, we are still waiting for that day when we love it. <laughs> I'm not sure we're even loving tolerating it, but each time it seems to get a little bit easier. Um, there are pros and cons with doing the batch system, and that was part of our agreement to the pro of having a larger group size of all one age to fill a barn. Yes, that's good. It's all in, all out in farrowing. As a side note, it did kind of help with data entry because, you know, you don't have pigs left in farrowing, so if you're still showing you got dead pigs there, you kind of can clean that out. So that made it easier, but the cons, uh, Though you could hear the cries out for more help from our team. It was, it was tough. I remember the first breed batch we did that was big, we took them off swine mate, which we had to learn what that was and how you use it. And little did we know that it works really good. And we had a lot of pigs in heat. And that was a very long three and a half hours we spent in the breeding barn with two technicians. But conception rate was good. We still remembered how to breed after 10 months. As we jump forward, this is our, our team. If you combine it up, we had 89 years of combined experience for these four employees. And uh, they've all been through a lot. They've been through PERS, PDV, well, relocation, tornado, tornado, don't want those again. But the batch farrowing system was really, really a tough. You know, we all kind of get caught in our compartments where we know our routines. We know our routines. And uh, it just was tough to break that routine. It's the same amount of work. We're just doing it in a lot less shorter time. It was a storm that uh, we hadn't no, no. The batch farrowing, like I said, was a, was a labor challenge for us. And our, as our help retires, uh, we're facing a storm that we haven't faced in 21 years as a staff. And that's hiring replacement employees while it's in a tight labor market. And uh, 
we've heard Dr. Olson talk about it, and it's we all are full aware of the labor market, and we're struggling with that now. So, soapbox to the veterinarians, production managers, nutritionists, feed mills. Before you do give the advice to do a batch system, maybe look at what you're doing in your work schedule for a, for a week until 75% of your employees, if you're going to do a four-week one, to go home and just leave you alone. And then try to get all that work done in a week. And then that'll help you put your place in the employee's shoes when you tell them they've got to do it. And then you'll understand, wow, what do we got to do to try to figure out to make this easier for them? So this, this chart represents over time how when we were a, uh, well, still are, a multiplier herd when we closed it in 2003. And on the top line is our total barn. We took off the numbers. I don't want you to know that. You're just looking at the angles. So the, the top number is total born, of course, live born, and then our number weaned. And in 20 is where we did the break. And then 21 is where we started all over again. And as Leon expressed how we kind of had trouble on that 2003 startup, you kind of hoped, gosh, I hope we don't go through that again. And as you can see, um, we kind of really didn't lose any ground. We're celebrating that. We did do a little bit of a two parity drop when we kind of was coming through the summer, uh, rolled into fall, but uh, all things, what we're doing currently looks really good. In that, so all the individual animals are indexed within the herd, and then when we do our selection on a closed herd, we take the, the cream of the crop, the pigs from the cream of the crop, and keep them back, grow them on our farm. So we assume, when we do selection, everybody's the cream of the crop. And the first criteria when they walk out of the barn is they better walk. And that's the first thing that we're looking at. And if they ain't, it doesn't matter whether you like the front legs or the back legs or which one you want better, she better be a sound, functional, structurally correct animal. Second thing is underlines. We, we evaluate the underlines. We farrowed a pig like in maybe 2005 because she was one of our, a daughter of one of our startup sows. And for a while I could remember the number because I'm bad with names, but it's been a few years I forgot her number. So I had to look her up. She had farrowed 260 total born pigs in her lifetime. Now, when they're indexing individual animals, over time, obviously, indexes go down, but maybe she was more like your favorite daughter, and she just kept looking like a little kid. You'd let her out, she'd run the hallways and run them back and do her job in farrowing. So they just kind of said, you know, you can just tell us when you want to go home or you want to leave. So 8.2 years later, we finally had to load her on the truck. 19 parodies. Still sound as the day we selected her, I'm sure. The only reason why she told us is she did not breed back that time and only weaned six pigs on her 19th parody. You want to talk about turning the corner on sow mortality. She was turning the corner and showing you that I could, I don't know how much longer she would have went. Economically, probably, she had a lot of corn. But she still, she had a total born average of 13.16 starting there in 05 on that axis, which was more than that green line, and uh, managed to wean a 9.9 .9 throughout them whole 19 parodies. That's a pretty good individual sow. I don't know, we never, never really had her look up in the database, Daryl, and see how many daughters she had on that farm. But that was kind of how we approached it. That was kind of our legacy, that building them sows is the, is the legacy of the farm, because that's how to keep it generating, to keep it going. Leon. And then we'll let Leon finish up, and uh, thank you very much.
<clears throat> well, today, what we showed you is our history. If there's a take a home for you in the audience, just think for a moment what you would do if a tornado hit your farm. We went nearly into panic because we didn't know what to do or where to go with the pigs. And the bright side of that is, what if you were a dairy farm and had 500 cows to get milked in 24 hours? Think about your neighbors if you have a dairy farm, how you could help them. What in the world would you do? So what we showed you today is some of our history. It may not mean much to you. We were glad to share it with you. But we know tomorrow remains a mystery. The present is a gift. And we encourage you to enjoy every minute of it. Regardless of what happens in the future, we know our family has a legacy of celebrating the success and weathering the storms. And I can tell you, Dr. Olson talked about passions this morning. I've got to share a passion of Dr. Olson. He dearly loves to hunt birds, and he has not lost that passion in 20 years. So, Dr. Olson, thank you for our relationship with AMVC. We thank you for tolerating our story and allowing us to be here today. Thanks to Kansas State for hosting this event and the opportunity for us to share some of our adventures. I guess we're ready for any questions. If you have any, and while you might be asking questions, we have some video pictures here that didn't make the presentation. So you might just recognize a few of the influential people in the pork industry who have shared the story with us as well. give a real story too. Here, you go ahead. Any questions? Comments? Yeah, lots of pictures there, but you can see the real thing. He's asking if I think batching is getting easier as we go along. Mm. Tolerating it better? Uh, some, some parts of it, loadout weaning day has been, uh, is a real challenge. Um, we do things a little bit different. We don't allow a semi to be backed up to our unit. Uh, we prefer to take them to the, to the road that way we don't have no traffic coming back here. So then we have a transition team at the road. We have shuttle team taking them there. Plus we've got a wean team going on and one guy putting them down an alleyway to get them on that shuttle. Um, we are recruiting for that day. It only comes every 28 days. So surely if you get away from pigs for five days and want to come enjoy the experience of that, we'd love to have any or all of you. That part is getting easier. We're, we're learning a few things as we go. Um, I'm wondering, they say the pig is a, a highly intelligent animal. This isn't your question, but I wonder why they can't see the gate is open sometimes. And why I still wonder after seeing a lot of sows Pharaoh, she can't hear that little pig under her. Come on. We hear it down the hallway. Why can't she get up? I don't know. But maybe we'll genetically select for the one that learns to pull the gate rod, run out there and jump on the trailer and do it himself. Maybe we can put more pressure on that.
I would just like to say from our experiences and the problems we've had, the seeds of solution are in every problem you encounter if you look hard enough and dig deep enough. And I think that was typified by Dr. Harry Anthony in his pursuit to figure out why we could not keep baby pigs alive. And he finally conquered the question that it was pseudo rabies. So if you got troubles, keep looking, keep digging, because there is an answer out there that you can move on. Big finish. <laughs> That's all, folks. That is a big finish. Thank you guys again. That was great.